Now, I had a question for all of you. Did you have any doubt on how to get into this building this morning? Did any of you use the windows? No. The reason you didn't use the window was because you knew you needed to use the door. All of you knew that. Every building that you enter into, you always enter in through the door. It's so obvious to us that we have to enter into the door. They don't have a sign outside the door saying, please use the door and not the window. However, when we read the scriptures and you read, turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 1. On this earth, every single time we enter into a building, we'll enter through the door. However, when we look at the eternal door, it says, it's, it says in, in John chapter 10, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheet but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. He who does not enter by the door. So in God's eternal kingdom, there are going to be people who are going to try to enter in some other way. God has put a door and wants people to enter into the, through that door, but people are not going to go through that door. For us in this world, everybody goes through the door. But in the heavenly kingdom, not everybody goes through the door. And Jesus emphasized it by saying, truly, truly I say to you. That means he's underlining and saying, in the heavenly kingdom, it's not like this earthly kingdom. There are many people who are not going to go through that door. There was a large ship that was created in the 1900s called the Titanic. It was a very big ship, and some presumed that it was unsinkable. And it left England all the way to come to the United States. And as it was traveling, it hit an iceberg. And on that night, when it hit the iceberg, there was only one thing that went would have went through the person who was sensible at that time after it hit the iceberg and it was sinking. What would the sensible thing be when, when, when the ship hits the iceberg and it's sinking? Anyone can answer. Go to the lifeboat. The gym, it had a gym, it had a squash game there, it had a swimming pool, it had all of these other things. But when it hit the iceberg, nobody was interested in all of those things, the lounge and all of that. The one thing that they were all interested in was the lifeboat. But I heard of an incident when the iceberg, it hit the iceberg, some snow fell from the iceberg onto the ship. And there were some young men, young people, kicking that and playing soccer. And I was thinking, the ship is going to sink in less than three hours, and you're here kicking around this ice. And the captain is shouting, get on the, put on your life jacket and get on the lifeboat. And it is like that. There are some things in, are very serious. Just like that captain was shouting, get into the lifeboat. And if I was standing there and I knew the seriousness, I'd say, young people, you may not understand the seriousness of this, but please go make your way to the lifeboat. You'll thank me later. And like that today as well, the Lord, the captain of our salvation, is crying out, there's a door. Enter through the door. Turn with me to, we're all, we're all we should be in John 10, verse 9. John 10, verse 9. <clears throat> I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Jesus said he is the door. Anyone who enters through him will be saved. 
And so what is this door? How do we enter into this door? If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it speaks of this door that leads to salvation in a different way. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's two types of sorrows, one according to the will of God, and the evidence of this sorrow is that it will produce repentance. The sorrow according to the world, it's sorrowful, but it will produce death. So just because we're sorry, it does not mean we're entering through this door. That sorrow must lead to repentance. We must produce a repentance in our lives for it to be this door. If not, what we're trying to do is climb through the window. If there's no repentance in our sorrow, we are climbing through the window. And that does not lead to salvation. This was a verse that our preschoolers had a few weeks ago. And so you may be able to help me with this. Matthew 7, 14. The gate, to, the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And how many find it? There's be few that find it. There's very few people that find this way to life. And if you knew that this door, to find this way to this door is very few, would you want to know if you're truly finding the, world, uh, the window? I mean, truly finding the door? Or would you be satisfied? Oh, yeah, I'm going to go through the window. If you knew that only a few people were going to enter in through that door, you'll be like, I want to be sure that I'm entering them. I want to be among those few who enters in through that door. You might remember, how many people found the door to the ark? You can shout it out. Only eight people. There was many people in the earth at that time, but only eight. Would you call that few? I would call that few. Only a few people found that door that day. And for us also, if that is such an important thing that only few people find, I say, Lord, I want to be sure I am going through that door. I wanted to speak about someone in the Old Testament who looked and found a window and was going through that window. And there's a lot of examples we can find out of people who go through the window so that we can not, as an example, not to follow after. And King Saul is one of those, a man who was anointed by God, a godly man, Samuel anointed him, he was called by God. He was filled with God's Holy Spirit. It says you'll be filled with God's Holy Spirit and turned into another man. He prophesied. He had a very good testimony on the outside with everybody. Everybody who looked at him would have said, this is a godly king. We're thankful for having him. But yet, despite having that good outward testimony, he did not enter through that door. We read, a godly sorrow will produce repentance. That word I put there, what is it? Because. Anytime somebody says something about you, says, brother, this is something that you need to correct, or sister, you need to correct this, if the first word comes out, oh, the reason is because. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is the incident where Samuel, t Saul t Samuel tells 
Saul, wait for seven days and I'll come and make a sacrifice here. And it says here in verse 1 Samuel 13, verse 8, Now Saul waited for seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. Verse 9, So Saul said, Bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offering, and he offered the burnt offering. And what happens next? Verse 10, as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? What's the answer? I went and I disobeyed. I didn't wait for you. I sacrificed. That should have been his, the right answer. What's his answer? And Saul said, because... I saw the people were scattering from me. And again, Samuel, you did not come within the appointed days. So I disobeyed. The moment there was a problem, there's something that a godly man pointed out. What was the first thing he had to say? He gave an explanation, an excuse, a reason why he disobeyed. This was not the first, this was not the only time. Turn with me again. To First uh, Samuel, verse 15, uh, chapter fifteen. First Samuel, chapter fifteen. This time, God had told him to destroy all the Amalekites. He said, "Destroy all the Amalekites," and he went there to. Dis- he was supposed to destroy all the Amalekites. He disobeyed God. He didn't obey, and when Samuel comes to correct him, here it says, uh, "Read with me, verse twenty-four." 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words. What's the next word? Because I feared the people and listened to their voice. He always had an explanation of why he did what he did. He'll disobey and then he'll have a reason. Why is this serious? I believe that there's many people who think on that day when they stand before the Lord, God is going to be listening to all their reasons of why they disobeyed. Lord, the reason I didn't forgive this person was, these are the reasons. Lord, the reason I did this and disobeyed here was these reasons. Do you actually believe that the Lord's going to listen to all those reasons? Sometimes when you play sports and you go to the referee and you argue with the referee and say, you know what, I really didn't get that. That was not my fault. Have you ever seen a referee say, oh yeah, let's, let's, since you argued with me, I'm going to take, I'm going to let it, let it pass? No. He's probably going to give you more penalty because you argued with him. But yet, when we're confronted with our sin, when God convicts of our sin, what do we do? Make an excuse, make a reason why we did what we did. There's another thing that we do, and these are all these windows that we can go into instead of going through this door of true repentance, trading with God. God asked him to destroy the Amalekites. He says, no, 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 I'm going to give you, instead of obeying you, I'm going to go sacrifice. But the Lord says, no, I don't want to sacrifice. I want obedience. But can I give you sacrifice? No, I want obedience. Sometimes, you know, the Lord asks us to do something. Ajay, he puts a finger on something and says, I want you to go set matter, that matter right. Lord, instead of that, can I go and help this brother out? That brother needs some help. Can I go and do that? Or I'll go read my Bible a little bit more. Oh, that person's sick. Let me go and visit them. No, I I want you to set that matter right. God does not want us to trade with him. When God asks for something, he wants that thing that he's asking for. He doesn't want us to trade with him. In Matthew 12, 7, 
God asked them to be compassionate. They said, can we sacrifice instead? No, I want you to be compassionate. I want you to have mercy on those people. I want you to forgive them. I, want, I don't want you to have any unforgiveness in your heart. Lord, can I do something else instead? I'll give some money maybe. No, I want you to forgive. Very often, the easier thing to do is what, what comes easier for us. It's easy, much easier to go and sacrifice something to know than to obey. It's another window, a window that many people take. Don't do what God asks me to do, but do something else to cover up. I wanted to go back to Matthew, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 15 again. You read a little bit more here. Verse 10, 1 Samuel 10. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I made Saul king, for he's turned back from following me and has not carried out my com- commandments. Guess who cries about that when he hears that news? Not the person who should have cried. Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Who should have been crying all night when he disobeyed God? It should have been Saul. Saul should have been crying and saying, Lord, how I dis- dis- disappointed you and dis- disobeyed you. Saul was distressed all night and cried out to the Lord and says, you know what, this man, he's going through this, and he's, he's, he's not going the right way. I see it. I see where this road will end up. I see it clearly. Saul's not seeing it. And so he's grieved. 12, verse 12. First Samuel 15, 12. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. And it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, <coughs> he set up a monument for himself. When Sam, Saul first started out, and they said, we want to make him king, do you know what he did? He went and hid in the baggage. This is the same man now building monuments for himself. Something has changed. He's not the way he started off. For us, too, we could have started off like that, hidden and tried to... Now we're putting monuments. Oh, that brother said this about me. Put that monument. That sister said this thing about me. Put that monument. And think about it, ponder about it. Verse 13, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. And then he asked, What is these sheep that I hear? You said you destroyed everything. How could there be some sheep still crying out if you did and obeyed God's word? Then he had a reason for that as well. But listen to this. Remember, Samuel is much older to Saul. Listen to the response. Chapter uh, chapter 15, verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, "Wait Wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. You remember how he was grieving over Saul, crying all night for him. Look at how he replies to an older man. And he said to him, what did he say? Speak. Is that how you would address a godly man? Verse 17, Samuel said, is it not true Though when you were little in your own eyes, you were made the king of Israel. And you might remember, he said, you know what, I went and I took these sheep to sacrifice. Do you know if that was a true statement? Was that truly the reason why he spared the sheep? It wasn't. Read here. This is what Samuel said. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And this was the real reason, but rushed upon the spoil. 
and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Meaning you saw that sheep and you wanted it. It wasn't a sacrifice to God. You wanted it. And you see the response again. Verse 20, Then Saul said to Samuel, Look at this. I did obey the voice of the Lord. He had disobeyed the Lord. He wanted the spoil. Spoke disrespectfully to the godly man who was correcting him and cared for a soul who cried over him all night. And has the, and this is the response he gives to him. Verse 24, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Do you believe these words? Do you believe that he's truly repentant here when he says, I sinned? He said the right words. The right words is to say, I sinned. It's the right words. I feared the people, and I listened to their voice. Verse 25, Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. Pardon me, or he's he's saying, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Did he say the right words? He said, I'm sorry. I said, sorry, let's move on. Let's go and worship God. He did not see the seriousness of his sin. If he saw the seriousness of his sin, he would not say, hey, let's, let's go and worship God. He would be grieving that he disobeyed God, disobeyed Samuel. He wanted to rush on to the next thing. And then he pleads with him, and it says here in verse 30, again he says, then he said, I have sinned, but what? Please honor me before the elders of my people, before Israel, and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Saul, little did he know the seriousness of this situation. He'll find out the seriousness of the situation 13 chapters later when he's in a tough situation. Right now, he's not in a tough situation. What did he want? He wanted to get the kingdom. God gave him the kingdom. He wanted the honor before people. Samuel gave him honor before the people. For him, he did not need God nor Samuel. Whatever he needed from God, whatever he needed from Samuel, he got the kingdom and the honor before men. So what use is God and what use is Samuel for him now? He's not interested in what they have to say. But little does he know the care God and Samuel had for his soul. It's a window. It's not a door. It's a window. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 28. These are one of the most saddest passages in all scripture. Remember, he had a very good external testimony. It says in verse 3, that Saul had removed all the mediums and spiritists. In the eyes of people, he had taken away all those who were communicating with the dead, the spiritists, the witches, the mediums. He had done that. But in secret, what was he doing? He's saying, go find a, a medium so that I can talk to Samuel. Outward testimony, if you went and asked any of the servants of Saul, what do, you think of Sam, uh, what do you think of Saul, your king? He fights the Lord's battles. He was anointed by Samuel. He hid himself behind the baggages when they called him to be, become king. He put out all the mediums and spiritists. Who knew his true condition? God did. Samuel knew, and he himself knew his true condition. The rest of the people had a very good testimony of Saul. 
Could it be like that for us? We all have a very good testimony. What's happening on the inside is what we don't know. We have this danger, each one of us has this danger, that we can be like Saul, very good testimony in front of everybody here, but yet, in secret, there's something else, a different story happening in secret. It's serious, it is serious. But the same man, Saul, look at how he's, when, when, when it says in verse 14, it says, an old man is coming up, and he's wrapped with a robe, and Saul knew that it was Samuel. Look at how he responds to Samuel now. And Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and did homage. Remember how he spoke to Samuel when he didn't need Samuel's advice and guidance and correction? And see how he did. When he was put in a desperate situation, you see how he respected the same man. It says that I am greatly distressed for the Philistines. See, he's in a point of need, and he knows the only person that he can go to is God, Samuel. And this is what he says. God has departed from me and no longer answers me either through prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that I may know what I should do. Samuel says, why then do you ask me since the Lord departed from you and has become your enemy? Why do you come to me now? God stopped speaking to him, not recently. He stopped speaking to Saul. You know when? 14 chapters ago in 1 Samuel 14 is when God stopped speaking to Saul. When did he take it seriously? When he was distressed and put in a difficult situation, that's when he realized it. Verse 18, it says the reason, as you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his wrath on Amalek, so the Lord has done this thing. The seriousness of that he sees now. <clears throat> There's a lot we can learn from him. Who wants to keep us in chains? Do you know who wants to keep us in chains? Holding bitterness, unforgiveness, not repenting. Turn, to, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. If God may perhaps Grant them repentance, to the no leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 26, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been captive by him to do his will. So who doesn't want a man, a brother or sister, not to come into repentance? It's the devil. He's happy to have them in, bound by chains, getting them to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But a bondservant, his heart is the same as Jesus had. I believe it's in Matthew 12, 29, where he says, unless the strong man is bound, you cannot ransack his goods. The devil is very happy to have people bound in sin and un unforgiveness, unrepentant. It's with great difficulty does people get away from his clutches. In the many years, I don't know of many people who've come to the church, who've repented, who've truly came to know the Lord, and then 
fall into sin, and then repent. It's very rare. That's how much the devil tries to put people in chains and bind them so that they will not go. And we read of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 26. Uh, You can turn with me there. We'll go there. We won't read the full thing, but you can read it afterwards. But 1 Samuel chapter 24. It says in one place that Saul greatly loved, guess who? Greatly loved David. Would you believe that? At one point in time, he says, I greatly loved David. He's found favor with me. Let him be my armor bearer. That's what it said. But then after he defeated Goliath, he had some victories. There was a word that was spoken. David has killed Ten thousands, Saul only thousands. And it says there, actually, let's turn there. Yeah, it's in chapter 18, verse 7. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul became very angry for this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Verse 9, Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. That's when it started. He saw God's blessing on another person And he had this jealousy that sprouted up, a small seed of jealousy. He could have taken care of it, but there was no Samuel to correct him. The Lord was not correcting him. He had his way. So he said, you know what? I'm going to let whatever I want to do, I'm going to do it. There's nothing to restrain me now. Jealousy? Okay, I'll have jealousy. And he had jealousy towards David. And you kind of see this in chapter 24. He goes there, and it says that he was going there with his men, verse 20, chapter 24, verse 1. Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Verse 2, Saul took 3,000 chosen men from Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks and the wild goats. So he went with so many men to go and get David. And kill him. And so as he's going with his his men, he has to use the restroom. You may know this. So he has to go, and they didn't have restrooms like we do now. So he had to go into a cave. And David and his men were in that same cave. And so as he was using the restroom, David goes and he cuts a little bit of his garment. And did you know that David felt bad about it? It says his conscience bothered him in verse 5. And David's conscience bothered him just because he cut a little bit of his garment. That's how sensitive David's conscience was at this point in time. Saul's conscience didn't bother him. He was ready to kill a person he was jealous of. But after this, you know that David spared his life, even though his men asked to kill him. He had an opportunity to protect himself and take revenge. But he said, you know what, I'm going to spare and it says here, listen, listen to this, when, when, when David spared his life. 16, when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is that your voice, my son, David? Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Do you believe these were tears or sorrow? A godly sorrow that leads to repentance? What do you think? Or do you think these were, were, it was sorrow, there were tears. But do you think it was genuine? What would we find if it was genuine tears of sorrow? There would be repentance.
This is called a jack-in-the-box. And the jack-in-the-box, all you need to do is wind it. And when you wind it, I haven't tested this yet. It pops up. The jealousy came up and sprung out. And then what does he do? He goes, okay, I'm going to cover it up. I'm going to cry, put it down. Sometimes you need to test it. So two chapters go by. Turn with me to uh, 1 Samuel 26 now. Then the Zephites came to Saul, verse 1, at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding on the hill? So, verse 2, Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph. Didn't he cry? Didn't he say, isn't this my son David two chapters ago? Didn't he tell David, wasn't it? I would have thought if he said that and he cried like that, I thought, oh, I'm safe now. But what happened? He pushed in that jealousy which was there. He covered it up. He didn't deal with it. And guess what happens? comes back out again. And this is what happens. We keep pushing it in instead of dealing with it and repenting, truly repenting of it. If we don't truly repent, it's going to bound to come up again in our life. Brother, sister, all of us are tempted. If not, if we're not tempted with all these things, God would not write these things down. Are we tempted with jealousy? Yes. A brother does something and somebody praises that brother or quotes that brother or does something for that brother. (gasps) Why wasn't it me? Or somebody does something good to that sister, that sister gets praised. Why not me? And that jealousy, small jealousy, springs up. We go cover it up. Ah, no, no, it's nothing, nothing. What's going to happen? Some zip fight will come and hey, remember David? And then I'm, I'm sure he would have gone, oh yeah, they said 10,000 for him, only 1,000 for me. Yeah. He forgot all about that, my son David, weeping, all of that. He forgot that. Let's go kill him again. Same thing happened with Pharaoh. God said, Moses came and said, let the people go. How good it would have been if the first time Moses asked him to let the people go, he let the people go. The people wouldn't have suffered. He wouldn't have suffered. The first plague comes. All the fish die. Okay, let the people go. No. Goes on, goes on, goes on. People get suffering, boils, All of these plagues come. Many people are harmed by it. All because he does not want to let the people go. God's trying to break him, trying to bring him to a place where he'll repent. But no, he'll stand his ground. Stand his ground. Then the firstborn dies. His son dies. And finally he says, okay, you go. Leave here, go. And it says in Exodus 14.5, you can read it later. He had a change of heart. Shortly after, after he saw these guys, what did we do? Why did we leave them? He forgot all the ten plagues. He forgot that his son was lost. Everything. He went after them again. And this time what happened? He lost his army too. All he had to do was yield when the Lord asked him to let the people go. But he was stubborn. And I believe the devil would have said, hey, how could you let those people go? 
you should put an put a iron fist and keep those people. And he said, yeah, I'm going to keep them. The devil told Saul, be jealous of him. Don't, let, don't, don't forgive him. See what he's done. He's going to take the kingdom. Be angry with him. Be jealous of him. Try to kill him so that your son can take the throne. And yeah, yeah, he's listening, listening to what all the devil says. You remember how it said in 1 Timothy, the devil takes them and holds them to do his will. We must say, you know what? Come to our senses like it says in that verse and say, you know what? It's the devil who wants me to be bound by jealousy, unforgiveness, all of these things. It's the devil. I want to be set free from this. I want to forgive. I don't want to be jealous. Even if there was jealousy in my heart till today, I want to be set free from all these chains today. I do not want to give a foothold to the devil. I do not. I'm not ignorant of his schemes. Can we say that? I'm not ignorant of his schemes. He's trying to get me bound by jealousy, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. I'm not going to give him a foothold in my life. What do we do see in radical repentance? How do we see it? There must be fruit. There must be some fruit of repentance in our lives. If I was Saul and Samuel told me that the Amalekites were not all destroyed, what would my reaction be? I hope my reaction would be, I'm sorry, Samuel. I, I was wrong. Army, come on, let's go. We need to go and obey. We need to go and set matters right. Let's go and obey God's word. Let's go and destroy everything. Let's not make any excuse. No, I don't want to worship Samuel in front of people because that's going to give a false impression that everything's right when it's not. I'm more, I'm more concerned about God's opinion of me and what my true condition is in secret. I want to set this matter right. That would be a fruit of repentance. It would have gone so well for Saul if he had just done that thing, let me. It wasn't too late. In chapter 15, it wasn't too late. He could have set that matter right. For us, it's not too late today to enter in that door. It's not too late today. One thing with Peter, I love to see when he, when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You know what the next verse says? What, about what Peter said? Do you know what Peter said at, right after Jesus said that? Do you know what he said? He said nothing. He didn't make an excuse. He didn't say, Lord, it wasn't like that. I really had a genuine concern that you wouldn't go to Christ. No explanation, no excuse. When Jesus said, get behind me, say, Satan, you're thinking with your interest or man's interest, he says, kept quiet. He didn't say a word. His repentance was in secret. He went back home and I believe he would have cried and said, Lord, I'm sorry for thinking so earthly. No excuse. No explanation. Years later, when Paul corrects him and says in Galatians 2.14, why are you a hypocrite? You know what the next verse Peter says? There's no verse which Peter replies. There's no verse. He doesn't have an excuse. He doesn't put an explanation of why he sat in that other table. Oh, it was hot on that side of this, on the room, so I moved over. No explanation, no excuses. He just quietly went back home, I believe, and repented. Lord, I who corrected Ananias and Sapphira so severely that they fell down dead, have the same hypocrisy in my life. I believe he would have wept bitterly that night in secret. True repentance brings sorrow, great sorrow in secret before the Lord, not before men. And the other thing with sorrow that leads to life is that we're willing to say, Lord, I do never want to do this ever, ever again. If you ask Saul, Saul, are you going to be jealous again? I don't think he would have said, Yes, 100%, I'm not, I do not, I saw the seriousness of jealousy. No, 
I covered it up. Yeah, I may be jealous again. But a person who truly repents, he's seen the seriousness of sin, he hates it, will say, I never, ever want to do that ever again. As you're walking down the street and you step on something you shouldn't have stepped on, would you say, oh, you know what, maybe I'll do it again? Or will you say, I'll never, ever do that again? We say that, I'll never, ever do that again. Why can't we say that with sin? Jesus, why did he say it's better to be blind and lame than to sin with this arm? Some people, when they have serious sickness, and the doctor says, either you have to cut off that arm to save, off, save your life, or if you have that sickness, you will die. What do they do? They have to make that choice. Is it better to have that arm and die or cut it off? And that's what Jesus was saying. Are you going to take sin that serious that you'd never ever want to do it again? Where you didn't, if you don't have that arm, you can't do it again, right? That's how serious the Lord says, take the sin. I say, Lord, I want to be like that, Lord. I never ever want to do it again, Lord. I want to have that seriousness to sin. And as I close this morning, All of us have heard about the seriousness of sin, about repentance, a true repentance being the door that we should not go through the window. But Job also heard things like this from his friends. He heard from uh, Elihu, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. He heard all of those things. Did it cause him to repent? Turn with me to Job chapter four, uh, 42, I'm sorry. Job chapter 42. There was one more thing that needed to happen after he heard. Job 42 verse 5. I have heard you by the hearing of your ear, but now my eyes see you. For each of us, if we just hear what we heard today and don't go and have a meet with the Lord, you can be moved and you can be convicted, but you have to go where Job went. But now my eyes see you. Therefore, I take back everything that I said. I repent in dust and ashes. How did repentance come for Job? It was after he heard all the things he heard, he went before the Lord, and he saw the Lord, and he did business with the Lord. And there was true repentance before the Lord. We see that also with Peter. It says in Luke, one of the most wonderful verses, Luke 22, you can turn there. Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then he went out and wept bitterly. His repentance came from looking at Jesus. A kindness that came, a kindness that led him to repentance. This morning as well, brother, sister, and young person, Go to the Lord. True repentance comes by looking at Jesus, saying, Lord, I heard all these things, Lord. I don't want to go through that window. I see the seriousness that there's a few people that enter in through true repentance, Lord. I want to be among them. I want to enter in through this door. I want to have true repentance, which comes by meeting with you, Lord. You shall see greater things than these. Do you know who Jesus said that to? You will see greater things than these. Do you know? It's Nathaniel. Why did he say that to him? Because he was a man who said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And he says, this is a man who did not have any hypocrisy. He was an honest man. And to that honest man, 
He says, you will see greater things. You'll see the Son of Man. And I think today as well, if we also can, like Nathaniel say, like it says in Romans 7, 18, in this flesh dwells nothing good. Just like he said, in Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like that way, if we can say, can anything good come out of this flesh? I see bitterness, I see jealousy, I see anger, unforgiveness. Can anything good come out of it? And if we're honest before God, God can also say to us, you shall see greater things. You shall see the Son of Man. And when you see the Son of Man, you'll come to true repentance, like Job came to, like Peter came to. And I had to share this verse. This verse came from our reading plan, this morning's reading plan. God has granted repentance that leads to life. My longing this morning, brother, sister, young person, is that each one of us will find this narrow way that very few find of true repentance. Let not the devil put you in bondage any longer. See the schemes of the devil who wants you to have bitterness and unforgiveness and jealousy deep-rooted. Meet with the Lord. See his face this morning, and he will set you free. You will be able to Get the repentance that leads to life from the Lord. May the Lord help us. Amen.